Hello folks and welcome to the 7th episode of Unheard, a podcast hosted by Act that delves into the extraordinary stories of individuals who are challenging conventional principles to disrupt India's social impact landscape. Our guest today is a pioneer in the Indian venture capital space. He's a managing director at Peak 15, formerly known as Sequoia Capital India and Southeast Asia, one of the largest venture capital firms globally. Mohit has helped catalyze some incredible founders and led investments in companies that you might have heard of like Zomato, Freshworks, Oyo, Misho, Cars24 amongst many others. He started out as an engineer at Ericsson, soon after which he co-founded a mobile startup called Brightpod. He then returned to India from the US to join Bharti Airtel in 2002, helping scale it to the first 100 million users. Armed with sharp insight on how internet and technology could disrupt India in the coming decades, and with a deep desire to be part of india's growing entrepreneurial energy mohit transitioned into the venture capital space where he's played a significant role in leading india's journey into becoming a global startup hub how i know mohit however is as a philanthropist with a big and bold vision a vision somewhat different from what we've seen in the philanthropic space in india over the last many decades and we'd love to deep dive into that more today welcome to unheard mohit Thanks, Akanksha. My, you've done me proud with that introduction. <laughs> And I think that was just a short version of of everything you've done over the years. Um, but getting right to it, Mohit, um, you know, I've heard you describe yourself as an accidental VC. Um, but you know, someone who's looking from the outside, um, even when I connect the dot backwards, actually, to me, your professional journey makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, a young engineer, failed startup founder with immense learning, um, then a professional who led an internet mobile juggernaut's growth in its early years. So it's no surprise that you were able to channel all that knowledge uh, into leading India's tech startup boom from the forefront. Um, but connect the dots for us a bit on your philanthropic journey. You know, how did your interest in social impact come about? Were the seeds planted in your early years, or was this a gradual evolution? So, Akanksha, um, I became a VC all the way back in 2006, and one of my early investments was in Ujjivan Microfinance, and uh, it uh, allowed me to see how you could create a very successful commercial public small bank while also alleviating uh, poverty. And I saw the double bottom line impact that, uh, in this case, venture capital could provide, uh, where you you were basically not just creating a very well run uh, profitable enterprise but you also did good to the communities that nurtured that company i saw that same trend play out when zomato uh, you know gave birth to feeding india to robin hood army where it was all about uh, creating a business around food but it also meant you could actually feed the hungry and the not so privileged uh at freshworks uh you know creating uh, programs that allowed uh, computer engineering and science to be offered uh, to folks who did not have access to it to helping uh, women come back to work uh after a break so i just found all these different entrepreneurs who were building very exciting businesses but while they were doing that mm. they had somehow found this ability to actually nurture and give back to the community to the communities that were sort of uh, giving birth to them I think it firmly sort of established for me that founders are very unique human beings. Uh, they have this uncanny ability to go long, to be relentless in their pursuit of, you know, trying to achieve something that that creates a large company, but also solves a really hard to solve problem. Mm. And so, if they can build these massively successful companies, they can definitely also sort of lay the foundations for a better world. Mm. and i think that's where it all began to come together for me mm. let's get a little bit more personal mohit um because i think as you started noticing this in your professional journey i know you also started dabbling as a donor you were starting to sit on some not for profit boards um and in particular i know there's a a plan that was uh made on the back of a napkin with uh, with ashish thavan so um share a bit more about about that how did all of this kind of culminate into you saying hey actually i'm someone who also wants to you know become a philanthropist you know given that i was convinced that founders can create massive change i started uh, you know writing uh grant checks on an individual capacity to some 
uh, small businesses. I remember this one particular uh, founder who came to me looking for a consulting gig. He had mm. fortunately gone blind uh, during the course of a very successful career. And I told him, instead of giving you a consulting gig and which will get over in six months, why don't you actually create a company that can actually mm -hmm. help blind people navigate their mobile phones more efficiently? Because you seem to be doing it quite well. You mm -hmm. just arrived for this meeting with an Uber. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, Pramit created this software application called Louie that actually helps blind folks uh, actually voice navigate multiple mobile phone screens. And I was going about this journey, enjoying these kinds of you know creations. Till I realized that they all suffer from the same common set of problems. Uh, they need their next round of capital. Mm. They need to hire world-class talent, on, especially on the engineering side, to build mm. really world-class products. They need networks that can actually help them scale and uh, get promoted across, you know, various state governments or various, uh, you know, private enterprises. Mm. And it was with that thought that I sat down with Ashish because he had obviously lived a private equity journey and had now sort of started Ashoka and was giving back at scale. And I think that's the napkin you're referring to where we actually used uh, the placemat uh, mm -hmm. at uh, Amore at Malchamag mm -hmm. to actually draw out a little bit of a picture that shows how we can have these different verticals around health and education and environment. We can create a platform Mm. That allows them to get easier access to funding, easier access to people, easier access to government when it makes sense. Mm. And I think that was the birth of the idea, at least in my head. So it seems like all of this was brewing. You know, it was kind of culminating into something that was drawn. Um, and then COVID happened. Um, and, and I think that's when we saw a lot of this coming together in a big way, Mohit, um, because ACT raised almost 600 crores during that time and deployed it to great impact. Um, and I, I have always felt it really brought your philanthropic aspirations and mission and vision to life in a big way. Um, so share a little bit from, from that time, you know, what did you learn about philanthropy, about impact um, in ACT's first avatar, and maybe also what you learned about yourself? It was a crazy time. Uh, I think COVID was the closest I've seen to war. And um, as things were just failing all around us, uh, each one of us, you know, looked inward, made sure our families were safe, made sure our firms and our companies and our employees were safe. Uh, but it was uh, at such a scale that I think it shook us all from in inside. And I remember a bunch of us investors and founders, Abhiraj from Urban Company and uh, Macon and uh, Prashant and Shekhar uh, from Axel, uh, GV from uh, Sequoia. We all got together and we were like, we've got to do something here. Mm -hmm. And I think what resulted was a very special period where literally on a daily basis, we were spending close to 10 to 12 hours uh, reviewing ideas that could actually put a dent into this massive uh, challenge that India was facing. Mm -hmm. To pick one, I remember oxygen being by far the single biggest uh, challenge as to how do we basically get all forms of oxygen into India and Indian hospitals quickly. And we had a group that was basically overnight learning all about PSAs or these oxygen plants that we put 106 of these, uh, you know, using uh, startup e mm -hmm. ecosystem infrastructure. And we got it put into the smallest hospitals in the widest, uh, you know, far out states of India. Uh, we had to lift... Uh, close to 30,000 plus oxygen concentrators from places like China and others. And we use the logistics infrastructure of the startup world, think delivery, think Flipkart, and, you know, imported these machines and then were able to distribute them. We use the balance sheets uh, temporarily of many of our startup ecosystem players like Zomato and others to actually help place the orders for many of these oxygen uh, tanks. So my single biggest learning was how everybody came together. But the reason it was working was just shared trust in the collective that we were trying to do this, uh, you know, in a much more purposeful way for the country. Mm. So single biggest learning is uh, doing this as a collective mm. way, way better than trying to do this individually. Mm. And I remember I was watching it from the outside during that time. And, and I remember, you know, the word that keeps coming in my mind was it just felt magical. Mm. Um, and you use the word collective. And I know... Many people since have spoken about how ACT was one of those really great examples of collective philanthropy and collective action. And I think for me, a few things that really stood out during that time was one, there was also no full-time team. You know, at the peak, there were four, five hundred volunteers. And yet, you know, work streams were forming. Um, 
great outcomes were being delivered. Um, people were really creating their own seat at the table, building conviction about what was the need of the hour, um, high bias for action, using data to, to and, and, and experts, and, you know, again, leveraging the ecosystem um, across private social sector, public sector, uh, to really bring it all to life. Um, but transitioning from that, um, what would be interesting is share about how that evolved into ACT in its current avatar. And, and how we describe ACT today is uh, we call ourselves a tech-first venture philanthropy platform for social change in India. But embedded in that are at least three ideas, if not more. Um, the first around tech-first. Uh, solutions for social change. The second is around venture-like grant making. Um, and the third, which you've spoken a little bit about already, is this platform approach. Um, so share a little bit about how that, you know, kind of um, evolution happened, what were the underlying insights, and um, and what really gave you hope that, you know, this would really be the next chapter that would be worth uh, worthwhile. Like I said, COVID was a little bit of a wartime. Uh, scenario and when we all reflected as it was uh, you know coming to an end uh, I think we all realized that we had all gained more than we had given uh, mm. and it was very fulfilling uh, for a lot of us involved uh, that uh, we were able to sort of think beyond our own uh, you know personal needs and sort of come together to do something a little larger and more purposeful mm -hmm. and so there was this uh, strong thought that we have to sort of keep the platform going because we don't know when the next crisis is going to come and we certainly feel like we can create impact. Mm. So this is something worth doing. There were two big challenges. First is everyone made time for fighting COVID uh, and then everybody went back to their day jobs. And so from 350 volunteers who were fighting uh, COVID along with us on the ACT platform, uh, we had to now quickly transform to a full-time team. Mm. And I think that's one of the biggest wins that we've done collectively here with, you know, your help and your leadership is to actually build a solid, high quality team. The second thing I realized is health consumed us all during COVID. But mm. a lot of folks in the startup ecosystem cared about other causes, mm. things like education, environment, uh, equal rights for women were equally important causes for many folks in our ecosystem. And since this had to be a collective and a platform, it was important that it stood for the three or four largest purposes uh, that folks cared about. So we broadened it from just health to include mm -hmm. education, environment, and women uh, as, as a three new verticals. Each one of them having their own uh, dedicated teams, each one of them having their own IC, where ideas are bought up to the IC and grants are given. Super important that uh, we include people who know the most about the problem before we try and attempt to solve it with the tech first approach. Hmm. So if you look at our three uh, ICs, uh, we have an education IC an environment IC and a, a health IC. On the health IC, we have people like Nachiket, hmm. who've actually spent decades thinking about how public health can sort of envision for India. Hmm. People like Dr. Ajay from Swast, Sandeep, who's the venture capitalist. Similarly, in environment, we've got GV and Prashant uh, who to try and filter through ideas to see where most change can happen. Mm -hmm. On education, we work together with Ashish uh, Dhawan, who we spent time with Central Square Foundation and creating a beautiful institution there. Uh, Makin, who's ex-Flipkart, but now spends all his time in helping uh, you know, education through government initiatives. So I think bringing in these cross-functional experts is one way that this platform comes alive for me. The second thing is uh, solving for common sets of challenges. Mm. So uh, it's easy to say we should be tech first. It's really hard for us to expect our grantees to uh, hire and access world-class tech talent. Mm -hmm. So if you see that as a common need, you can create a platform like Tech Advisors, mm -hmm. where we go out to the startup ecosystem and say, we don't need your money, we just need your time. If you're a programmer and cares about social causes, can you spend some time with our startups? and actually help them create the right technology architectures. For example, how needle moving would it be for a grantee at ACT to get 12 weeks uh, access to a UI UX expert from Urban Company mm -hmm. or an ex Google engineer that actually spends uh, on a 12 week sprint with them and gets their thinking and process correct. And finally, uh, when you're starting something as wide as call it gender parity, uh, 
you need to come from a place of actually in seeing what the current data is. And, you know, we can talk about this till, our, till we go blue in the face, but I love the team's approach of saying, let's make gender parity first come alive in our own startup ecosystem. And to that extent, the Visor report that has 200 startups participating, has McKinsey putting together the structure and then working with people like Odeti to put together a annual research uh, highly you know, thoughtful and insightful around what are the, what's the current state of affairs. I think at this point now, we have close to 40 grants given across mm-hmm. these different verticals post-COVID. Mm-hmm. And uh, close to 15 to 20% of them uh, have got follow-on funding, yeah. which by the way, just to digress, is exactly the venture model. Mm. The venture capital model is that of a power law. Out mm. of all the investments we make, Mm. Uh, close to 10 or 15% of investments are the ones that really drive the mega returns of the fund. Mm. And I think that's the new thinking that I hope I can bring to the world of venture philanthropy. I think what we want to try and catalyze here is moonshot ideas Mm. to solve really hard to solve problems that haven't got solved. Mm -hmm. And it's completely okay for 15 or 20% of the ideas that we give initial grants to, to be the ones that scale. Yeah. Because these are hard problems and not every idea that we apply to it will work. And so this ability to think that risk is good, not everything has to work and it's okay to fail so that you can come back stronger on your second idea and we collectively learn is the venture philanthropy model that I think we really want to try and underscore. Mm. And I want to double click on one thing you said, Mohit, because this used to come up a lot in our early days, less so now. Um, But, you know, a lot of people would ask us that this is philanthropic capital. Um, and some of the solutions are not going to make it, uh, which has happened, by the way. There are some incredible solutions that we backed um, and unfortunately were not able to you know, figure out a sustainable business model that worked for the Bharat audience, which we are very, very centered on. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that comes up that how do you make peace with the fact that this is supposed to be money for impact, but um, you're saying that we need to have a risk appetite. Um, would love to hear your take on that. Look, at the end of it, you're solving for impact. Everything else is mere conversation to get that impact. I don't think we benefit the world or India by becoming the 101st foundation that does it the same way. Mm -hmm. What we're attempting to do is an experiment called venture philanthropy with this new approach of risk-taking and moonshots. It may or may not work in itself, Mm -hmm. but we are willing to give it a go. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is as long as we hold the bar high on impact, So, for example, let's take a company like Rocket Learning that we've partnered with. When we first started with them, close to a third of their annual budget came from ACT. Mm. But today, less than 10% of their annual budget comes from ACT. So it's an example of how we can catalyze others to start giving and participating in growing some of these social unicorns. Uh, Rocket Learning has over 3 million learners across 10 states of India. Mm -hmm. They have finished an RCT with JPAL that suggests quite uh, carefully that anyone who goes through a rocket learning course is better prepared to succeed in school. Mm -hmm. Parents are changing behaviors to actually spending more time with their children to make them successful in school. Mm -hmm. I think it really doesn't matter whether there are two other rocket learnings that did not work in order for rocket learning to work. It's more important that the 3 million learners on rocket learning now sort of scales to 30 million. Very, very well put. Um, So building on the rocket point, Mohit, um, what you know, what do you feel actually has been um, the most exciting part of the last three years, um, given our current model of venture philanthropy? It's been a short span of time, obviously. And uh, like you keep reminding all of us, this is not a time to declare victory at all. uh, Far from it. Um, But share a a bit on what's been exciting and um, fueling that energy for you. Yeah, I I think it's important to remember that nothing's really done yet. It's uh, 1% done if that and uh, we've got miles to go. Um, I would say there are three things that are beginning to uh, give me at least confidence that we're on the right track. The first one is um, it's hard to be a founder in the social impact sector. It's super hard. Uh, It's a frustratingly long time uh, to be able to see the impact that you're trying to see. It's super hard to access capital for you to actually attract the best talent and then go long. Uh, it's super hard to work with, um, you know, many other constituents and partners who actually ask more questions and ask for, call it, precise answers way before you've actually discovered what the answers can be. 
I think in that, when we create a rocket learning where uh, someone like Aziz, who you know graduated from Harvard, had so many other options in life that he could go spend his career on, decides to become a social entrepreneur. Uh, someone like ACT, along with the ecosystem, supports him. He then becomes a role model. He would serve the entire team, then become role models for the next set of founders who have a choice to either go into the you know in the for-profit commercial world or actually uh, go in the social impact world. Mm. So I think we've helped create a few role models. Uh, mm. I look at Karya, I look at Rocket Learning, I look at many of our other founders. They're beginning to sort of uh, demonstrate some of the characteristics and skills that inspire the next gen. Mm. I think the second thing we've done is outside the individual company, we're beginning to establish a few new business models. Mm. So for example, Karya uses uh, this concept of, I will pay you uh, uh, well for, uh, for the work you do. They actually use rural uh, Indian women to help perfect the uh, models, the AI models being created by, by the Valley uh, companies. And you can ask anybody to upskill. And sometimes the benefit of upskilling and paying for that upskilling is not so obvious to the person. But not only these, are these women now earning, they're actually gaining in their confidence and now they're going to be upskilling themselves because they want life, better lives for themselves and their families. So I think these are new business models that we will try and put into place, which again should help provide new pr- frameworks for the next gen. Mm. And finally, capital is scarce in social impact. And I think when we provide this initial seed capital from ACT. It allows business models to get created. It allows companies to move the ball forward. Uh, Cloud Physician is one of these companies that ACT had uh, partnered with during COVID time, uh, when it was so hard to go face to face for uh, medical reasons. Uh, Cloud Physician's uh, remote management of ICUs Mm. was a critical uh, reason that ACT gave them a grant. Well, that business model has scaled. And today Mm -hmm. is very relevant because now Cloud Physician now services over 200 hospitals across India in a for-profit manner. Mm -hmm. And they have attracted venture capital funding uh, for their next round. And so giving rise to new business models that then catalyze further rounds of funding would be the third thing. So role models, new business models, and catalytic funding would be the three things I think Mm -hmm. that make me feel we're on the right track. Mm. Love it. Um... And so the the flip side of that coin, um, what do you feel have been the biggest you know challenges or or even in the coming time roadblocks that that we might face? And I'll put I'll share some candidly, uh, which again you know we we do grapple with. I think um, the first big one is just this um, you know again the the hope but also the peril of really. Uh, betting on tech first solutions, right? So again, I I continue to believe that given the scale um, of our country, and if we really want to see some some big change in our lifetime, I feel technology is both digital tech, deep tech are going to be critical enablers. Um, Having said that, they do come with their own challenges, again, because of the audience that we're working with. Um, you know, there are behavioral roadblocks, access roadblocks, affordability roadblocks that come in the way. Um, so that's one big one. Um, another one that we, we also hear about a lot is, um, it is going to be hard for one solution to really be able to attack all of what is Bharat, right? It is just a very, very diverse population that varies across cultural context, language, uh, again, economic uh, layers and so much more. What do you see as as the biggest challenges that ACT needs to be prepared for in, in the coming time and in, in being able to really double down on this tech first venture philanthropy model? I hope to see more founders and more capital. These two things would be the challenges that I would focus on. Mm. Uh, I feel with uh, things like ACT and other foundations out there, we just don't see India's best talent stepping in to solve some of these hard problems. Mm. And I wish I could wave a magic wand to tell people that this is a more purposeful, uh, better mission uh, to follow in life. Mm. And if you can give your best years to solving hard to solve problems in education and environment and healthcare, I think we'd all just be way better off. So Mm. attracting India's best talent to these problems is probably statement number one. Mm -hmm. To that extent, you know, I want us at ACT to uh, try new experiments around incubation, where we actually pick some of these hard problems. So that would be one problem area. Second is um, 
I hope eventually, if you go out and you become a $10 billion company, I would want you to give 1% and create a foundation of your company. Mm. If we can create a $100 million uh, foundation across 10 companies, that's a billion dollars of foundation Mm -hmm. that can emerge from the startup ecosystem. It's not just the quantum of money, but those same founders will have a massive vision and a ability to actually execute execute against that vision to use that money in a very catalytic way. Mm -hmm. So I want to attract more capital that comes not from things like CSR, which is a little bit of a tick box for many, but literally put a percent of your very valuable company into giving back into the communities that have actually nurtured you to be so successful. Thank you for for surfacing both of those. Um, I, I want to go back to founders because actually... That's been a, a theme, I think, in everything you've shared today, how your journey in the space began, what's going to be really valuable in the coming decade, as you just articulated. Um, and so one thing, again, I've heard a lot of VCs talk about is here are the traits of a successful founder, um, you know, founders who are going to go on to build great companies, maximize shareholder value. Like these are their recognizable traits. Um, over the last four or five years, what do you feel are the traits of a successful social entrepreneur, Um, you know, what are the qualities you feel they exhibit, the skills they need to bring to the table um, to ultimately create what you said, the double bottom line? I think one common trait, whether you're getting invested in Bike Peak 15 or you're getting a grant for Mac, founders need to show up every day. And they need to do that for over a decade. Hmm. If you really, really apply yourself to a problem for that long, you will find a way, you will crack it. Mm. And so this trait of going long, not taking short-term decisions, but knowing that you'll be doing this and working on this problem 10 years later, Mm. just is a very different kind of human being Mm. who doesn't flit or get distracted every time there's a challenge that sort of comes up. Mm. I think the one thing that's different that I've noticed in our social impact entrepreneurs is you don't need to be so sharp elbowed for you to win nobody has to lose Mm. i think this ability to be a whole lot more collaborative knowing that you have like-minded folks who are trying to solve the same problems and the ability for you to share for example india is such a great example of creating digital public goods Mm -hmm. i would want Mm to give a lot of grants to Mm -hmm. a startup who then creates digital public goods that are easily given and transferable for no cost to Mm -hmm. other startups so that they can keep building on top of that. So I think this collaborative nature is a core part for our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Couldn't agree more. Mohit, you've seen a a huge transformation in India, I would say, you know, maybe 2010 to 2020 with the, the startup economy and again, India becoming this hub of you know, largest number of unicorns only behind, I think, US and China. Um, What is your hope for India at large um, for the coming decade, especially when it comes to the kind of social change or social movements you want to see um, in the country? What what comes to mind? See, I think the one of the biggest issues going on in the world right now is uh, that the rich are getting richer. Globally, we're seeing issues around, uh, you know, immigration into rich countries and the set of social challenges it's creating. I think uh, given the size of India, it is hard to move the country uh, as one together. There will be these pockets of acceleration across different uh, parts of our population. Unless we are able to sort of um, constantly think of things like the digital divide, Mm. Constantly think of how digital payments can, you know, allow for a more inclusive future. I think we risk um, seeing some of the frustration and then some of the negative elements of that. And so the dream I have, at least, is while we continue to measure our success in GDP and growth Mm. and so on and so forth, Mm. this ability to measure our success in how many people are, you know, uh, able to get a solid education up to 10th grade, mm. how many our people are have access to basic and better than basic health care. Mm. Uh, the environment, I would say, continues to be 
a lower priority in India than it needs to be. It gets a lot of lip service, mm. but we are getting more and more accustomed to living in dirty and polluted cities. That's got to change. Mm. So I think of India of the future is one where the quality of life, mm. I would say the, the, the disparity is not as much. Mm. I think it's super important at this stage to create very successful role models that others can follow. You know, India had its first set of IITs and they've become globally so successful and sought after. Mm. Uh, Ashish is trying that with uh, Ashoka and, you know, Ashoka's success in itself will not change India, but Ashoka's inspiration to so mm. many other institutions getting mm-hmm. created will, will transform mm-hmm. education. So mm-hmm. I feel like that's the role we play at ACT. Mm-hmm. Our job is to create social unicorns, if you will, mm-hmm. that really deliver impact in education, in environment, in health, in uh, uh, gender equality. And if we're able to do that, not only will we see that one success in that one or two companies, but we should hopefully create a little bit of a snowball effect. Super. And I'd love to end with a call to action, Mohit. Um, If you had to make a clarion call um, for the young people in India, you know, folks who are in a position to lend their, you know, voice, um, to lend their time, to lend their money. Um, what would be a, a big, bold call to action that you would make? Look, honestly, uh, this is not a nice to have. This is not a clarion call. I would say it's each of our responsibilities to get involved mm-hmm. and uh, make yourself accountable to yourself that you need to uh, not just pontificate and talk about these issues, but get mm. involved to solve them. Mm. If you think the act way is a way to solve it, get involved with us, with mm. your time, your money, your your uh, your voice. Mm. If you feel there's a different way to do it, that's fine too. Mm. But get involved. Mm. Don't don't be a bystander passively to mm. the set of challenges that India faces. Mm. Love it. Thank you so much, Mohit. Thank you, Akanksha. Thanks for everything you and the team do. This brings us to the end of our seventh episode of Unheard, a podcast presented by Team Act. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to our Spotify and YouTube channels, where we'll bring you more unheard stories of people who are passionate about creating impact at scale in differential ways, people who truly stand apart from the herd. Follow us, like, subscribe, and share.